Good morning and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, we're going to wait just a few more minutes for uh, additional participants to join. Uh, Cliff will be typing some uh, questions into the chat box, uh, which will be helpful as we conduct this seminar. Uh, and we'd appreciate it if you could type your answers in there. It'll be interesting. I think you'll be uh, amused and intrigued by what people are, are, are saying. Thank you. So these are the three questions we'd like you to take a look at and answer in chat. What was it that made you come to this particular webinar? Second question, how nimble, aka agile, is your company in terms of its ability to devise and implement new strategies quickly? Third question, what inhibits nimbleness in your organization? Okay, well, let's let's get started. Yeah. Uh, welcome. Uh, we're pleased to uh, welcome you to the announcement of the Constructive Agility System, uh, which uh, is a, a unique program that really provides a strong path to agility. Next slide, Cliff. Uh, this is our leadership team. Uh, Cliff is a managing partner of the Agile 2 Academy. Uh, I'm a partner, Dr. Marcel Bastianello is a partner and Dr. Raj uh, Nagapa is also uh, a partner. We, we bring a diverse set of skills and experience uh, to uh, Agile transformation. And in today's webinar, we're gonna talk about several things, uh, why agility matters, uh, that agility is behavioral, uh, that how the product solves the need. And what I mean by that is the constructive agility system, uh, how it solves a need that uh, seems to be unmet. Uh, we'll talk about transition, uh, the cost and the value of the system, and then we'll have a, a round table. So go ahead, take it away, Cliff. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, so these are the questions from the chat. I don't know why it's the chat's not working. Uh, the Q&A is working. Um, so maybe type your answers in the Q&A, although the Zoom chat says everyone can chat. So I don't know why they can't. Anyway, okay. um, let's let's get started. Uh, so we're not uh, you know taking all the time with this. But if you want to type in the answer to the question and you find that you can or type it into the Q&A, please do. And we'll 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 try and get to it. OK, it looks like Cliff, we're starting to get some responses in the chat. So. Well, that's funny because I don't see them. <laughs> anyway, um, so so you're seeing the chat. So uh, uh, just chime in if you think appropriate. So you know to get started with with the slides, you know you know at agility matters. Agility matters more today than ever. You know, and and there have been rumblings in the agile community, and I've contributed a lot to it. We have contributed. You know that the agile movement. You know, is it does it still have legs? You know, what's hat? Maybe, maybe its time has has passed, <clears throat> and you know there are reasons. There are reasons for that, but agility will always be important, and and it's more important today than ever <clears throat> because the world is changing more quickly all the time. There's nothing we can do about that. It's it's a reality. It's accelerating, and it actually <laughs> scares me a little bit, but it is our reality. And organizations need to be able to pivot quickly and efficaciously. They need to be able to make good decisions at speed. Anyone can go fast and make bad decisions. The, the, the trick is to be able to make rapid decisions in an experimental way and move quickly, but make good decisions and analyze those decisions well and 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 be able to respond continuously and and the the decisions the strategies need to be innovative and creative or we won't be able to succeed they can't be just the same old thing and unfortunately uh you know because i i alluded a little earlier that you know what's happening with the agile movement 
there were some good ideas in the Agile movement, but a lot of it kind of became very dysfunctional. And I'm not going to go, you know, deeply into that, but I'm just going to say that there, there are a lot of ideas in the Agile community that aren't quite right. <clears throat> you know, ideas about what good leadership is, for example. The ideas in the Agile community are very ideological and don't really represent what the research tells us. <clears throat> so we need, we need to be research-based and, and fact-based in this. In our analysis of highly Agile companies, we found that agility is mostly behavioral, that it, it, it arises out of the behavior of people, and that behavior is generated by the behavior of leaders, including the, the incentives that they create and the way that they respond to situations, respond to people, respond to incoming information about new circumstances and the decisions they make and how quickly they make decisions and what they do when things don't work out. Those behaviors uh, are watched by everybody else in the organization, and uh, people take their cues from what the leaders expect and what the leaders also do. And some of the the aspects of behavior cover, you know, cover uh, things like communication. How do people communicate things? You know, do you always have to be in a meeting to communicate? Uh, <clears throat> developing people, or even are they developed? And what's your your approach to that? Uh, the the organization's culture, which really is the amalgamation of of the behaviors uh, across the organization, and also the shared paradigms, the shared patterns for how to solve certain types of problems, like how we do things. And uh, transformation, you know, how, how do you initiate and, and make change happen? Uh, you know, if, if you wait for change to happen on its own, you'll wait a very long time. Change will always happen. But if you want change to go in a certain direction, it takes a lot, a lot, a lot of pushing and a lot of incentives and, and a constant, constant evangelism and and discussion and nudging and uh, questioning and, and change is hard and to make change happen takes a lot of effort on the part of leaders and everybody else. And flow uh, and from and flow can mean a lot of things, but flow in terms of the flow of work and how flexible that flow is, which is an important uh, foundation for agility. And it's leaders who generate these behaviors. Yes, the, the individual contributors doing the work manifest the behaviors, but they, they generally respond to what's expected from leaders. It's leaders who create the climate that then creates uh, behavior. And behavior is you know, important, but it's not the whole story. People also need to know patterns for solving problems. For example, if you, if you give someone a challenge and say, how do we improve our quality? And they, they have studied Project Management Institute methods, uh, you know, such as uh, you know, controls and, and reviews and things like that, they'll use those tools because it's all they know. But if they know lean techniques and flow-oriented techniques, they will think, huh, you know, there might be a faster way to, to achieve my goal of improving quality, maybe by having fewer checks, but by expecting people to be, be more precise or more careful or check their work more. You know, so there might be flow-oriented techniques to speed things up and actually improve quality instead of adding lots of, of roadblocks. So the patterns for how to do work and how to solve problems are extremely important as well. But, but still, that's not enough. You have to have the behaviors. <clears throat> and it's, it's, I mentioned it's leaders who generate behaviors. I wonder if everybody knows who these three individuals are. There, there are lots of, of leaders that, who we've, we've looked at. Um, but these, 
you know, these three stand out for particular reasons. I'm not going to go into, but each has been really amazing in, in certain ways. The, the one on the left is Jennifer Doudna, uh, who rec received recently uh, a Nobel Prize for, uh, you know, the CRISPR-Cas9 system for editing DNA. Uh, she, she won the Nobel Prize also with Emmanuel Carpentier, but they in their labs did the research to figure out that problem once the idea occurred to them. <clears throat> and of course, the middle one is Satya Nadella, who, who did a major transformation culturally in Microsoft, which is a big step to sh uh, ship to steer. And then um, the infamous or famous Elon Musk, um, who is, whether you like his politics or not, which I'm not going to make an opinion on, uh, he has demonstrated uh, just astounding leadership in certain ways that achieve amazing results, uh, transforming two entire industries. So we have to look analytically at people like these and others to try and understand what it is they're doing, not to copy everything they do, but to try and learn from them and, and take the best things, not take everything, but, but try and learn and take the best things. Product development requires particular forms of leadership. It's not the same as, you know, leadership situations are very contextual. They're very different. And in product development, there's certain types of leadership that are particularly important that, that you don't really see in other areas. Um, and by product development, I don't necessarily mean uh, a product that you shrink wrap and sell. I, a product is something that your organization makes that creates value. And if that's true for you, you develop a product. Um, now, uh, the types of leadership that are really important for product development are the ones that are, are more toward the right in these check boxes. You know, so, you know, being a visionary, well, we think of Steve Jobs. Uh, all those three leaders who I had before are, are visionary. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not the right most box, but it's, uh, it's up there. It's really up there. Uh, Socratic leadership, which is the, the, um, uh, the tendency and ability to ask hard questions. Uh, and and help people learn by challenging them. How how are we solving this? How are we dealing with that? What do you think we should do? And by using a question first approach to things. Uh, servant leadership is very important. The agile community talks a lot about servant leadership, but it's it's just one slice of behavior that's really important for effective leadership in a product organization. Being inspirational. It turns out uh, our research shows that that's not that important, <laughs> but it, it is important, but it's not way over on the right for product development. Again, that's not to dismiss it and say it's not important. It is important, but it's not among the most important factors based on our results. <clears throat> Being an organizer, Products today are complex, and we need people to get things lined up, you know, to get processes going, to, to make sure things are happening, to watch the clock, uh, you know, how much time is passing. We need to make a decision now. We can't let this drag on. Time matters in business, and getting organized helps people to be effective and efficient so that you don't spend too much time swirling uh, and, and you know, spinning your wheels, so to speak, and you make good progress and people aren't being inefficient. A take charge person, this is sometimes referred to as decisiveness, is really important. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be an assigned leader, but very often that's the best way to make sure there is someone who's taking charge. It depends on the situation, depends on the individuals. But there needs to be someone who is making action happen. 
um, because people are busy and things easily languish. There needs to be someone who's saying, okay, that's what we're gonna do to see, and we're gonna try that and then see how that works out. And you know, there needs to be someone who um, you know, moves things forward and kind of takes responsibility for things. There also needs to be an advocate, you know, someone who can make sure that the people we depend on are still supporting us. And thought leaders, we need thought leaders, people with ideas, people who are very knowledgeable, who, who can make sure we don't make, ter make terrible mistakes because of what we don't know. And of course, self-leadership, because we all need to be leaders. You know, there, you could write a book on each of those. <laughs> so, um, and in our examination of highly agile companies, we found no similarities in terms of processes and practices. I mean, there was overlap, but there was nothing in terms of process or practice that was common to all the companies we looked at. But what we did find is huge overlap behaviorally in, in terms of, of behavioral norms in those organizations. And I'm not gonna go through this list. These are, are some of the behaviors that we found to be very common. <clears throat> and the thing is, these behaviors can all be taught. They can all be taught. Um, Jennifer, I'm, uh, I've just noticed you have a question. So if it's a short question, um, let, let me just allow you to speak. Is it a short question? Because I want to get through the slides. So I'm, a, I'm, I'm allowing you to talk. You should be able to speak. Hey, I don't know what's going on with my Zoom. Oh. I don't have a current question for you. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> so because these can be taught, we created a curriculum. And it's a developmental curriculum. So, you know, there is book knowledge, so to speak. There are actually video lectures. Uh, but we all know that that's just the starting point. It's really important to have uh, you know, content that you receive in that way or in some way, because, you know, that type of content that you watch or you read or are told or explains about, it gives you the taxonomy. It gives you the models for thinking about things, but it's only step one. You then have to turn that into real knowledge by trying to apply it and reflecting on outcomes and also discussing it with more experienced people so that you don't draw the wrong conclusions. Uh, because when you try things uh, and you're new at something, you can often make learn the wrong lesson. And so discussing situations with more experienced, knowledgeable people is really important. <clears throat> so we developed a curriculum that includes developmental elements in which people try things in simulated situations and then can discuss those with a knowledgeable facilitator. And we, we call this curriculum Agile Two Foundations, but the larger set of, of, of tools, uh, it we call, I'll call the constructive agility system because it includes more and includes um, dashboards. And I'll, I'll show that actually in the next slide. And these dashboards are of two types. Uh, you know, one on the left, you know, there are behavioral uh, metrics. And these are based on, on surveys that people actually, uh, this is a snapshot of, of the surveys. But these are, the ones on the left are behavioral, which we assess from, from surveys that people take on a recurring basis. And the ones on the right are trailing indicators about outcomes. How agile are we actually becoming? You know, what is our cycle time? What's our quality? What is our meeting load? Um, you know, so by, by being able to measure those things on an ongoing basis, we can trend what's happening and see if we're actually getting better in these ways. And this is a built-in component of, of this, this toolkit. Uh, 
I mentioned, you know, this is this is actually the knowledge pyramid, and there's a, a learning model that basically is is this. But we we just think of it in terms of a knowledge pyramid, where when you learn things, you you start out by receiving information, receiving data, and then you incorporate that, you you interpret that in your mind and turn it into information. But it's not really actionable. It's like imagine someone just explains something to you. You kind of get it, but you have to think about it. And so, you know, to think about it, you go through it in your head and maybe you try it. And by trying it, you start to develop knowledge and over time expertise. And when you apply knowledge over a long period of time, you start to make larger scope connections and you reflect, and then you start to develop wisdom. And, you know, the, the bottom parts can be taught uh, to a degree. And we tried to address move up as high as we could in the pyramid. But there's a point at which you really have to take it yourself and, and build on it through through actual experience in, in your own work. Uh, the approach is, is somewhat unique and it's very unique, uh, we think, within the Agile community and within the leadership community because it's, you know, number one, it's, uh, it draws on what's actually known from research. You know, there's no ideology, there's no framework, there's no no process that someone uh, has. You know, this is what's actually known from lots of research about leadership, organizational culture, um, research in organizational culture, behavioral psychology, cognitive science in terms of how people communicate, how they think, how they create. And guess what? People are very diverse in those ways. There is no best way. Face-to-face -face communication is not always best. <laughs> it depends on the situation and the individuals. Um, <clears throat> you know, so these are complex topics, uh, not simple bumper sticker topics. And operations research, uh, uh, an operations research view of, of flow and lean of theory and theory of constraints. And the approach is, is very dialogic, diagnostic plus dialogic. You know, we're very big on appreciative inquiry, which is related to a Socr the Socratic, Socratic inquiry, <laughs> you know, where you, you start by, by uh, taking an interest in what the other person thinks first, and you ask questions before you give your own opinion, <laughs> and being very clear about things, not using words in a sloppy way. Like uh, self-organizing team. You know, I can't count the number of times someone has told me, well, a self-organizing team isn't really completely self-organizing. Well, then why do we call it that? <laughs> you know, we're being very unclear in the way we talk about these things, and that causes miscommunication and confusion. Uh, We've done a lot of work with this organization. Uh, they have an organizational culture model that they've been using for 50 years. It's a very robust model. It's been used with 30,000 companies. And, um, you know, they, uh, you know, it's, I just want to share, you know, what they think of our work. They like our work a lot. So um, anyway, we're proud of that endorsement. And in terms of outcomes, can you really put a value on this? You know, if if you if you look at the cost, say, of hiring one more person, and then look at the value of actually improving your product cycle time and actually improving quality and actually reducing people's meeting load and actually improving decision making, um, all these things, th these things have immense value at the organizational scale. And so if you can improve these things, you know, the, the cost of the system is, uh, it, it's about the cost of another person, more or less, you know, but, but these things really have very substantial value. And in terms of transition uh, in, in onboarding this system, we, we have a very, very thorough on-ramp that, that we've developed with our early clients in this. And, um, you know, the intention is to be able to, to make it go as quickly as possible because, you know, there's, you know, there's the licensing contract, there's the, you know, I'm putting it in, 
your learning management system. There's the talk, working with your training people to map it to a curricula that they have and capability maps that they have and all these different things. And, you know, so we, we have an on-ramp developed from experience to make all that go, go as smoothly as possible. And there's a training team guide to, to help the training team to figure out how to, how to link it in with existing training programs in the organization. And the, uh, the system is designed so that you get, you get updates as content is improved or added to over time. It, it's not an add-on. It, it's just whenever there's an update, you're notified and you can, you can easily download and install that update into your learning management system. And we, we have, uh, you know, we have a, a monthly license, uh, but the annual license is cheaper. So we recommend what, what our early customers have done is they start out with a monthly license and then they transition to annual. And the, the components are designed to be largely independent, but they kind of go into groups and the, the groups are as, as shown here and you, you can license a portion uh, within they basically license one group. <clears throat> and Steve mentioned a, a round table. So we, we plan to um, probably next month, uh, I'm not promising when, because um, uh, there's, there's a lot that needs to be done to make this, make this real, but we plan to launch a round table of, of users of this. And you know, right now we we have just a few, a handful of early users, so that's not enough for a roundtable. But um, once once we get some more, we're going to launch a roundtable where uh, where um, organizations using this can actually share notes and and help to steer the direction of it. And we plan to launch that as a space within the um, constructive agility community that that we operate. A space is like a, a sub area with, within that. Yeah, essentially it's a community of practice and the users define where we go and it's a way to uh, work with other people to uh, collectively solve problems and, and uh, develop your organizations. So uh, if you're interested in what we have, we've covered this uh, relatively quickly and we're gonna open up for questions here. Uh, I encourage you to contact us and we'd be happy to set up a specific demo uh, for your organization. So if there's other people beside yourself that you wanna invite or even to do a preliminary setup of that, uh, we're happy to do a demo. We, we think some of the elements in this are very unique. Uh, and uh, and they're also uh, very productive. You you should see a big lift in agility uh, and in behaviors that are related to support agility. So so uh, Cliff, is there a way we can open this up for questions? Yeah. Um, so it looks like with the Zoom tool, if someone raises their hand, I can. I can let them speak. I wonder if there's a way to just let everybody speak. Um, allow to talk. I can just go down and allow everyone to talk. What I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna click each, allow to talk, allow to talk. It's gonna take me a little while, but allow to talk, okay. allow to talk. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, everybody should be able to talk. <laughs> and if you wanna write a question in the Q and A, oh, it looks like we have a lot of questions in the Q and A. Those are, those are old questions, Cliff. Those are old, okay. Yeah, so if you prefer that, and um, I don't know why people can't type in the chat, but. So one question that comes up a lot is uh, what's included uh, in this system? Uh, and there's a whole uh, series of training 
that are available uh, at all levels within the organization. Uh, and you can scale it to the demand that, that you have. For example, uh, in leadership, as we saw, uh, as Cliff presented, there are a lot of different types of leadership and we go into depth in all of those, uh, though not everybody may have the appetite for that, but you get a very complete system uh, in the organizations that we're working with, uh, uh, they've asked that we train and certify their trainers to be able to deliver these materials uh, and, and programs. And uh, uh, we've we've started with that, and they'll be transitioning over to to uh, to train their own people uh, in, internally after they're they're certified. Cliff, can you say a little bit more about the, uh, the the dashboards and the tracking? I'd be happy to. And by the way, I know why people couldn't chat. There's that you have to actually click something else and then give it uh, anyway. So people should be able to chat now. I <clears throat> let's see. Um, maybe I can go back to the. Uh, we do have a hand raised, uh, Cliff, uh, by Thomas Martin. Oh. Thomas, please go ahead. Yes, yes, hi, Cliff, and hi, hi, Stephen. Uh, fascinating stuff, thank you. Um, I'm wondering, what is the endpoint um, of, of your transformation? So if you go in this and, and, and do what you just described, where is the point where you would say, okay, we achieved it, right? I, I, we created that more agile organizations it's all okay now for us to whatever i uh stop or go into maintenance mode right can you do you have do you have something in mind that 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 that, that allows us to start with the end in mind yeah so i you know i feel that um well you know we feel that you know one should always start with what problems you're trying to solve you know agility is not its own thing for its own sake um you know but it has a like, time to market you know how you know, part of time to market is how long it takes to make changes to a product. That's, not, of course, we all know that's not all there is to it. There's really, you know, the, the time spent in ideation, time spent talking to, uh, you know, people who are very close to the product and actually implementing new features and so on. Um, some of our clients right now are implementing AI-based features that they haven't done before. Um, so, you know, starting from that point of view, you know, if you find that, uh, um, you know, for example, your your cycle time to release a new feature is like three months, and you rather it be three weeks, uh, then cycle time's a biggie. You know, if if you find that you want to make sure your quality doesn't change, you know, and that quality can mean a lot of things. It it can be production incidents. It it can be. Uh, complaints from users. Uh, in one company I worked with some years ago, I, I actually got a report of their production incidents for a year and and tabulated those and correlated them with with kinds of testing. And you know so you you can find certain a aspects of quality that are really important. And if you want to hold those constant or improve them while reducing cycle time, then those are objectives, you know, and those objectives can be articulated as smart goals or, or whatever paradigm you use. Um, you know, so, so the, you're, you're not, you're never done, of course, and, and things change anyway. So once you're done, there's always a new objective. Uh, it's, it's an endless journey. But at any one point, one point in time, you probably have have goals of some type, or or a particular strategy you're trying to implement, and that would, you know, that should inform your your immediate, um, you know, targets with respect to to these, you know, these types of of measurements. Does that does that make sense? What are your yeah, thoughts thanks. on that? Yeah, thanks, Biff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so that would basically then that basically the answer is that that in the initial phases, you would spend some time when you start looking into your whatever your your KPI that you show on the screen at the moment, right? So you basically ask yourself a question: Okay, what do we want to achieve with 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 which KPIs or uh, 
are, are, are relevant for this, right? And then you you probably prioritize them as well and saying, hey, that 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 that's how we want to measure success of that. And then you are you make it very transparent and say, yeah, look, look, I we we will let ourselves we will allow ourselves to be measured, um, and that, that that that's a very fair statement. Yeah, and in our unwrap process, and you know, it with with the beta clients of this, uh, in each case, we actually uh, did start with conversations about what they wanted to do, um, and you know that that you know that, I mean we would always recommend that you know so there's this product, but I, I think the initial conversations really should start with. What are you trying to do? What do you feel the challenges are? And let's, you know, let's think through if this tool could help and maybe some other types of activities could help as well. We, we've run lots of workshops with clients of ours, usually in early stages, uh, bringing in, you know, other, you know, other constituents uh, to, uh, you know, to think through think through uh, whatever situation they're dealing with. Um, and then, uh, you know, it, it, always ends, it always has ended up where there's a, an important learning component that, that is, is needed because ultimately it ends up, ends up being about people's knowledge. It's, it's really about getting new ideas and new understanding and new abilities into people's heads. You know, so any kind of agile transformation is fundamentally a learning journey. It's not a process change. If processes are important, but we found that what is most effective is when people define their own processes and define minimal processes, because uh, when they define their own processes, they 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 have from the start a sense of responsibility for that process. And you know our our training program makes them think about more things than they would have thought of before. And they develop better processes and they think more about kinds of leadership that are needed and kinds of decision making and and how they can empower people and also help people learn how to make decisions without process, which is really important. Um, Agility is mostly about how you, what you do when the unexpected happens. And, you know, for example, um, you discover users don't really like some feature or you discover there's a new thing in the marketplace like AI and you need to pivot. You need to figure out what to do. It's not in the process. You have to respond right away, not wait for the next quarterly meeting to talk about it. And, and so it's about how you go outside of process to create a new process. That's the core of agility, how you break process and create a new process. And that's a judgment and collaboration and decision-making activity by its very nature. And so upskilling people on those kinds of things. And that's why you know, it's informed by behavioral psychology and leadership theory and so on, because it's fundamentally about what people know and how they can act um, when the unexpected happens. Well, let's uh, then summarize and, and we can end this. So we wanna thank you for your time and your attention and your interest here today. Uh, if you're interested in this system and wanna learn more about it, we encourage you to uh, give us a call and we can talk specifically around the parameters in your organization, the issues that you're facing and how this system may be a, a very positive intervention to help you improve the agility in the organization and also the key performance indicators that you have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye.